All right. So for this panel, uh, can I get Troy to come on stage? Troy is the founder of Juice, a best-selling author and a former head of acquisition at BuzzFeed. All right. A round of applause for you. Troy. Next, we have Adrian. Adrian is the founder of Solgar, sustainable travel gear using ocean... Ocean plastic. We need to use plastic instead of ocean plastic. All right. And this panel is going to get even better. We're going to start off with two and end with three. All right. Yeah, we have, uh, yeah, we have uh, John coming up shortly. Uh, but yeah, we'll be called Adrian. Um, cool, so first, thank you for joining us, no problem. Um, so the cool thing about John and Adrian is they're both uh, Times Invention of the Year for 2018. Uh, Adrian forwarded his suitcase. Uh, he can explain a little more about it. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you've probably seen it online. It's really cool, it's like the luggage that you can actually make, a, it's, like, it's like a closet within your suitcase. Um, Adrian can probably explain it better than I could, but if you want to tell a little about yourself and uh, the product. Yeah, so I'm Adrian Solgard. Uh, we we make sustainable travel gear. So we make backpacks and suitcases. We use ocean plastic to make the fabric of the products. We originally launched on Kickstarter almost four years ago. The first product was a solar powered backpack. Uh, previous to that, I ran a bike lock company that I also launched on Kickstarter. I ran that for three years uh, and sold patents to a guy in Belgium. And before that, I ran a Korean agency making TV commercials and music videos. That's back when I was living in Vancouver, Canada. Amazing. <laughs> um, so, what was going on in your life when you actually created uh, the Soul Card in your original project on Kickstarter? So I was in the process of selling the, the patents for the bike lock, and that patent sale didn't go very well. I had an angel investor who came on early stages, I didn't see eye to eye on the way we wanted it to go, and I basically got pretty screwed out of the exit there. Can you guys um, speak of the mic, please? Yep. Uh, so I got pretty screwed out of uh, the exit in that first business. Uh, and I was thinking, okay, well, I know how to make bike locks. I'd been on a date with this girl in Barcelona, and her backpack was swung between our chairs, and I thought, well, I know how to make locks. I wanted to make a travel bag for a while because I'd been thinking about these problems while I'm traveling. I'd been living in a couple different countries in Europe at that point, and it was like, okay, let's put all these things together and launch it on Kickstarter. Instead of being like one single component of product, like that's what we were doing with the bike lock, I wanted to launch a whole brand where we were doing the full product. Uh, yeah, I literally had six hundred dollars left in my bank account after that acquisition thing happened. I was pretty screwed. Friend let me stay on couch, and I took two hundred bucks to make prototypes. I took made the video myself, really scrappy, had my friend do the design work for free and said, we'll pay you after the Kickstarter campaign runs. Um, launched it six weeks later. Uh, went to, so launched it at 6 a.m., went to buy a coffee at noon. My car got declined, I was out of money. The campaign already raised 20 grand. Went on to raise 600K and the rest is history. <laughs> well, very impressive. <laughs> um, so what, what was about the product that made you kind of go all in on it, really full of conviction, believe that this is gonna be the next big thing that I should really go in on. So I think making, I made a product for the audience. So looking at Kickstarter, they like a very gadgety platform. So I made sure to add in all the kind of features that you wanted or that they want. And I think that there can be certain ways where you can make the right product for the right audience. So I decided just to go all in on it. I had a previous campaign that raised like 50K uh, a few years back. And I just thought, if I just put all these features into one, I looked at some of the other trending things like there was another suitcase at the time, there was uh, some other items, but no backpacks had ever done more than like 50 or 60 grand. Uh, and so I just decided, okay, this thing this thing could work, this is gonna change my life the way that I travel. I, I was like, okay, if this makes 100 grand, then I'm out of the shit that I'm in from this last business and I'll probably be okay. And it just ended up really sparking a fire. And I think that it was, you know, we played on, we, we looked at some data actually, took some data points where the, the amount of people working from home is increased. 500% since the mid 90s, and that's thanks to laptops. And four or five years ago, backpacks weren't really built for laptops. Everyone was buying these neoprene sleeves that they'd stick their laptop in and then put it in their regular backpack. And so I thought, making, you know, taking all these things that people are buying as add ons and just combining it in one, making like the Swiss Army knife backpacks. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, clearly worked out. <laughs> um, so, why Kickstarter? Why not Indiegogo? Why not go get traditional funding? Why not? I mean, bootstrap is obviously hard, but why Kickstarter? So when you go to Kickstarter, you don't have the middleman. When, when you go with an investment group, you have to convince investors that, hey, this business is a good idea, and then you're, you're relying on one or two people, whereas crowdfunding, you can put it up to hundreds of thousands of people, and then you'll really get a good answer from the market on if it's right or if you need to start again. Uh, and then you also, with Kickstarter, you, you can pre-launch a product before it's done, and then you actually get insight from people of if it's, you know, if what kind of changes you need to make, because the product you launch on Kickstarter is going to change in what you finally output. So I thought that was a good way to, to kind of beta test it. Also, I had no money. 
money, so I need to go fast. You're not gonna get 600K of investment from investors with no product, no roadmap, no ideas in that fast of a time, so <laughs> for sure. Um, so any reason Kickstarter over Indiegogo? So Kickstarter is just a little bit more well-known, it's a little bit more legit, um, and I think that might be shifting soon. Indiegogo offers a lot more support now for creators, for adventures, for products that are coming out, whereas Kickstarter is trying to be a little bit more focused on uh, music and arts and that kind of thing. It depends on what you want to watch. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so after you got this money from Kickstarter, and you had this idea, how do you go about funding sourcing? Because I mean, a lot of people in this room probably have done dropshipping, they've done Alibaba, they've done AliExpress, but you actually make your own invention, that's a whole different animal. Yeah, how many of you have been to like China, to the factory for anything? One, two, three, okay. And how many of you bought stuff from overseas to sell? Okay, cool. So when when you're doing like dropship stuff, you can buy a product that's already existing, you can see what it's like, but for, for us it was, we, I actually sourced a few bags from Alibaba and like checked the quality, and then I set up factory meetings with about five or six factories, flew over to China, and went to, went to several factories, went to the factory floor, how were the workers being treated, what kind of audits have you had done, and like there's certain companies like Walmart which are under huge uh, restrictions of the audits they need to do to make sure the safety of workers and, and the treatment and all that kind of stuff, and there's some other European brands, and you can just look for which ones are certified suppliers of those, and use that as kind of the gateway. Um, so yeah, it was physically going there, being on the ground, visiting several, and then getting samples made from a couple, and then comparing pricing and everything like that. What, um, did you have to do any kind of tooling or anything? I said also you had like a battery, and yeah. batteries, for everyone doesn't know, there's a lot of regulation laws around shipping batteries. There was, like, when we launched the campaign. Oh, so you got lucky. <laughs> Samsung Galaxy Note 7 happened for, like, three months before we started shipping the first product. Oh, so just had a solid power back. Yeah, it was like, oh, fuck. And I think that's the thing, with any sort of Kickstarter campaign, don't know what problems you're gonna run into, so you need to make it a fudge factor X. Um, so did you do any tooling, or is it just all? Yeah, we did tooling, yeah. So we had uh, one tooling for that. Can you explain to everyone what tooling does? Oh, so tooling, so if you ever made chocolates, and then like, when you pour all the chocolate into a little melting thing, that's a tool. It's a mold that you can you know, pour plastic into it. That's the very simple part of it. Um, that's good, do we explain that? <laughs> and so they made the tooling for the zippers, for the solar panel unit, we had like a, a very complex process because we had a solar power supplier, a battery supplier, because we were scared of batteries blowing up, uh, a Bluetooth speaker supplier, a backpack supplier, a block supplier, and then had to coordinate all of this. A lot of moving parts exactly. and a lot of complexities into one product. Yeah, but the fortunate, the upside of that is that we haven't had any direct knockoffs that have come, but people did come. I don't know if, if any of you were doing dropship, you probably sold the yeah, that backpack, that body bag, that came a few months after we were on Kickstarter, went viral, and they went everywhere. They went with like the cheap, version of, you know, a cut, a cut proof bag and like took off whereas we went on the higher end side with the battery and everything and that, you know, kind of the complexity like, helps avoid Kind of puts a motor on there when trying to, any competition yeah. coming in. Yeah. Um, so what, what was the big, is there any big hurdles that you approached um, besides battery or anything that are like, or is battery about uh, when you actually made the product for production side? Um, not too much. The actual manufacturing side was pretty straightforward. It just, you know, took time. It was a bit of a headache, but it, it worked out. Uh, the sort of the unknowns are always the shipping costs. So depending on the size of packages when you go international. So Kickstarter, you, you open yourself up to an international audience and that's something that really hurt us. I know that, that John, they sell a really big item and they've, they've, in, they've intentionally restricted it to US only and that's not a really good way you can do it. The international thing, you just, sometimes you bang your head against the wall and you're like, oh shoot, it's $200 to ship this to that country and they paid 150 bucks. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, international, especially if uh, John has uh, some large projects, like one called the products, like one called a, a moon pod, which is a giant bean bag. For it's fun to take into consideration when you're launching products. Um, besides the products, with shipping, if there's any regulation in other countries, just something to keep in mind when you launch international. Obviously, going international is always great because it expands your audience and potential customers. But at the same time, just be aware of any kind of issues that you may face in the future. One other unknown, with maybe something you know about is Chinese New Year. So a lot of the factories are coming up. It's, it's in the last four years, it's even changed. It's gone from what was two weeks to now it's like three and a half weeks. And now basically the entire month of February, most of our factories are like fully shut down. So that means everyone's rushing right now to get everything done last minute. And then right after they're backlogged again. So it's like a three month disruption in supply chain. So in our last campaign that we ran uh, from December to January of 2019, uh, we, we, we hit that, where February, everything slowed down, so our, our initial projections didn't take into account that like that hangover effect that it would have, and 
and so all the other people were in front of us at the factory, and so we were delayed like two, three months on that. Yeah, it's a lot of things. Like no one really thought you going about Chinese New Year that it, it, it is like a whole month and, and just completely stops production. And not only that, so now, so uh, in China, the, the middle class is really rising quickly, and the factory workers are making pretty good wages. In, in the areas we're working, they're making like six or seven bucks an hour. And so when they go back to their hometown during Chinese New Year, their friends will say, hey, you can come work at my factory and make six seventy five or seven bucks. And so 30% of the workforce is lost in factories, of the factory workers, just because their friends back home say, hey, come work with me, we'll hang out, it'll be great. And this happens every year for the last several years. I didn't know that. That's <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, that's the other reason for the hangover, the hangover I call it, of Chinese New Year factories. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunate. <laughs> um, so with the... Uh, like you, you're kind of products that get become so popular and so viral when everyone sees it. Obviously, cotton cats come out. Um, as you were saying earlier, like the backpack, it's great. Like that, uh, it has the battery component stuff. It kind of makes a barrier to entry for a lot of people that want to kind of knock you off. Yeah. Is there any other advice you'd give for people that are launching, like with Amazon third parties, like are any sellers launching an Amazon, AliExpress, anywhere that you can get? Amazon's easier to, to if you have protection of items, like any sort of trademarks or IP around stuff with patents, you can go in after Amazon pretty easily. Um, but yeah, copycats are going to happen. If you have a viral product, they're going to happen. And so it's honestly, I don't want to say other than accept it and maybe try to fight it as best you can. But also, you're, if there's copycats, you can kind of use it as free marketing for yourself and be like, oh, the original this. Uh, I have a friend who made the, um, it's like, for simplicity, it's called the air chair. You know what I mean? Um, it's like the airbag. Yeah, yeah, it was on Shark Tank, I think, too. No, it was on Shark Tank. Oh. He, you know, he's a Dutch guy, he was a garbage man. So he got this idea from like using garbage bags and blowing them up. His, he had been running the business for two years, then in 2017 it went crazy viral. His business went from like doing a couple thousand dollars a month to like 500 grand a week. His PayPal account got flagged for fraud, like everything went down, all these coffee cats made too much money. And it was, and his went so viral so quickly, he had to sell all of his patents and all of his rights to Fatboy. And then Fatboy went after all the coffee cats and now it's like the market's cleaned up. There's some problem to have. Yeah. Um, those are, yeah, those are, those are like champagne problems. Like his business was still going. So. Oh, of course. Um, so but you're still consistently making new projects. You're launching new ones on Kickstarter. Yeah. You have new inventions. Uh, do you have like a process for developing these new ideas, like a brainstorming, like a group of like trustees you go around that you bounce ideas off of? Like what's your process? Yeah, there's a few people that like to bounce ideas off of and also I, I think the most important thing is to spread your net wide at first and sort of throw it to this friend and that friend. I have one friend who's got the worst design sense, and if I show him something and he says, I like it, I like the features, but it's ugly, I know I'm on the right track. <laughs> so you kind of need to like, take this into account with like which what waters you're navigating and where things are going. Uh, and then I think depending on what the size and scale of your business is, you can do survey monkey and things like that to get people's advice. But at first, you're going to need to rely on a network of like friends that you have. and. You know, don't just ask all your friends who work in finance in New York. Like, spread it out as wide as you can to try to get the biggest variance. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so, now you have all this, we're talking about all these successes and everything you've done super well. <laughs> Let's talk about like, any failures you've had and what you've learned from them. Well, the, the, the shipping has always been the hardest part. And then the backpack or the suitcase or everything? Every single time there's been at least a $50,000 surprise. Uh, and on this last one, we had. Uh, we were fulfilling two campaigns at the same time back in August, and this was during the whole Trump tax everything. So we ran these campaigns before this extra tariff came into place, and like, there's certain things that are just these unknowns. So we found ways to ship them in internationally, because then they're coming in under the radar, and then just the, the way that those shipping costs came in ended up being like $100,000. It's like day. the under $800 yeah. to bring them in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's interesting ways to ship them to the country that uh, yeah, but so like just like when you go through customs at the airport and they get, I think it's like eight hundred dollars limit you can declare. Um, same goes, it's that's actually your daily like limit. So you can actually ship to like Mexico and bring into the country okay. or Canada, yeah, depend, any border and country or either. Um, and uh, you can actually bring in that way, not pay the tariffs on uh, your product if it's under eight hundred dollars. For direct consumer shipments, yes, but not for wholesale shipments when it goes. Into the oh yeah, that's like yeah. that's like have the exact address exactly who you're sending it to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, a nice little, yeah. little loophole. But, so I would say like ch changing things at the last minute at mission critical moments has always come up to be the challenges. It's, it's better, so, sometimes it's better to just like ride out the storm and like take it, like take one on the face.
face in front of the chin and then like keep going rather than to try to change everything to avoid it because sometimes trying to turn the ship around <laughs> ends up just being harder. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, so if you were to start all over again tomorrow, how would you do, how would you launch your company? Would you do anything different? Would you stick the same path? Interesting. Interesting question. Um, uh, the, the path for the time where I was at, I would do the same thing. Yeah, because I like I didn't go the venture capital route uh, because I, I wanted to maintain control of the company. I didn't want there to be, you know, these. In the first two three years of business, you're you think you're going this way, and you are going this way, but you might be going you know at ninety four degrees or ninety one degrees, and that doesn't matter the first six months. But after two or three years, then you'll really see that big difference where you're at. So if you bring on like co-founders or someone that you're maybe not totally sure about, that can can help. Uh, yeah, you're you're navigating through the box. So sometimes it's better to to not take on too many outside parties and have it just be internal as you go. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, so. It, have you seen the landscape of like Kickstarter, launching Kickstarter, um, a lot of your products change at all? Or because yeah, the competition or? Kickstarter's changed to be a lot more actively. Um, you're not gonna have a huge campaign on Kickstarter without a pretty big ad budget behind it. Uh, it used to be a lot more organic and viral, but now just with the volume of campaigns that are on there, it's different. Um, but it's still a great way to launch a product when you have that on. So like there's, there's a product that I wanna launch next year uh, that it'll, it'll be about 150 grand development costs before we can even start production. And that's gonna take nine to 10 months. So I'm trying to work out with the factory, like can we pay a small deposit now and then run the campaign on Kickstarter? Because then you can kind of, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a great way to figure out the beta test what you can tweak to, to launch your product with version 1.5 instead of version one. Um, so I think that's a, a really good, really good habit. Did you, um, cause I know you had a lot of attention after you launched, obviously you raised a good amount of money on Kickstarter, which definitely helps get the attention. But you also had a, pre had a lot of press and people around talking yeah. about your product. Did you uh, like source that press? Is it just is it yeah. because you're on Kickstarter that pre the press comes to you? Press for any kind of like organic product launch, for any kind of product launch is super important because it gives you that credibility right off the bat. There's a lot of people that do want to cover that stuff. Getting press on Kickstarter is a little bit harder, uh, but when you have a real product that you're really shipping, I mean, I guess, hold on, maybe we're spending too much time on Kickstarter. Who wants to launch something with Kickstarter? Who wants to launch like traditional business? So Kickstarter ends up, and like traditional launches, having a product. Couple, okay, all right. Yeah, I mean, so launch your product for that. Yeah, yeah. It's not Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, you had a lot of press. Do you think that like was that that was the fuel that really took your brand off? Yeah. Like put on the map. Yeah. Yeah. Press is definitely like one of the most. We have a full time in house press person now. We used to just work with, try working with agencies, or I would like email myself say like, Hi, my name's Sarah. This is this company just launched this product. You should check it out. Yeah, Sarah's our code word for me. <laughs> um, and, and that works. So yeah, it's, it's really important. Because it gives that stamp credibility. So yeah, so like the other forms of credibility, if you don't have it, like obviously be like reviews, could be uh, as press, or like a lot of times like for agency, you try to press for uh, influencers or celebrity. Yeah. So do you ever do the influencer route much, or is it really we, just focused on press? We've done the influencer route, uh, trying to work with like micro-influencers, like 50 to 150K followers. And it's just changed. The landscape has changed so much of that because there's certain ones that are doing it like the, the one post we've done does not work anymore. That worked maybe four years ago, but now I think it's about getting ambassadors that are really like hold your brand values in place and they, they work with you for a long period of time and there's kind of consistency of their, their audience seeking that product. Um, just, just a one and done, don't work. Yeah. Um, yeah, people just think that kind of you throw an influencer you can get a ton of sales. Yeah. I always see influencers more so as like a brand awareness kind of play and uh, give you content to actually do purpose in advertising or on your website. And I think influencer wise TikTok right now, there's a really good arbitrage there where it's there's no valuation compared to Instagram, so they're a lot cheaper to work with than Instagram, like by a mile. Of course. Um, have you done much with TikTok on the influencer side? We've got five TikTokers with like between two and five million that are all having stuff coming out this week and next week and like rolling forward. We've done twelve month contracts with them where it's like I just decided let's go all in and see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, very cool. I mean, uh, TikTok's definitely still, it's, everyone knows about it, everyone's still talking talk about it now, but it's still uh, way undervalued uh, follower-wise. The, like, the follower, the cost per like, follower for posting, of, like the cost per to Instagram is significantly cheaper yeah. still. Um, so it's still a great opportunity in that if you're launching a project and uh, want some influence to push, TikTok's definitely a thing to look at. Um, 
So, uh, when you're launching the your newest your newer uh, your newer products, do you feed back into your users like get feedback from them, yeah. or like how do you like leverage your existing data to launch your next projects? So it depends on how big the innovation is. If it's a huge set of innovation that's got addable stuff, we can't we can't really publicly release anything. So that's going to be much smaller groups. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of yeah we, we we get as much information as we can when we go out. I'd love to try launching a product next where it's like fully crowdsourced, just the idea of like hey we get a long list of hundreds of problems that people have, and then like find the data points between those problems and then make a product that goes. I think when you ask the question of what would you do differently, I think that's one thing that would be a, an interesting way to start a business is you gotta find a huge audience of people that are passionate about one thing, see what they see as common problems, and then make a product for them, and that way people feel engaged in the thing. Building community around product launches is one of the most important things. Yeah, I mean, if building like that community around like your audience, people already found your products, they're buying multiple, they're buying one, they're probably buying the other. Giving them that buy-in of they feel like I was part of this yeah. can go definitely go a yeah, long way. Sure. Um, so you mentioned the patent side. How important do you think patents are uh, for your products? Because I know like a lot of people are launching products. Most people avoid the patent route. It's expensive. It's limited. Like it's also you have to go through patent lawyers and make, go through the approval. Yeah. How important would you say that actually is for launching a product? Ninety-five percent of people should probably just avoid trying patents because the problem is, and, and I had one instance where someone did directly copy our patent, and I talked to my lawyer about it. Okay, they're copying and they're selling it mostly in a few other countries. So for you to go after them is going to cost sixty grand just to go after them, and they're selling one product, and that's gonna do one for the business. So it's kind of a long-term play to have patents, where in the short run, it doesn't it doesn't give you the right to just stop somebody from doing anything, because people are gonna do illegal things, and it just happens, and you, you can't stop them from that. Yeah. It gives you the right to pursue them and to go take them to court. So it's it's a, it's a an expensive route to get started. It'll cost you anywhere between 10 and $20,000 to get the patent, and then it'll cost you anywhere between 15 to 100 to defend so depending most people on, forget about that part. Like yeah. a lot, most people, like I talk to, they they want like they watch Shark Tank and they'll see like they always see on Shark Tank is this patentable? Like did you patent this? And they don't take into consideration that yes, you can patent something, but if you don't defend the patent, it's not. What does that do for you? Just if you get that paper, that's great. But what are you gonna do with that? Yeah. It's uh, it's very expensive to actually defend a patent. Have you had to defend any? Not not yet. We're we're doing some like defense on one now. That's where the Amazon thing comes into play, where we reaching out to Amazon to say, hey, this product copies our patent on this locking system, and then it'll flag that seller, and it'll kind of make some attacks there. How um, did you launch on Amazon right away, or is that a uh, later term uh, after launching the defendant? Later, we launched on Amazon maybe eight months after we actually had product and had some consistency of sales. Uh, as uh, I guess, how many of you are Amazon sellers? Okay, so when you, when you launch something on Amazon, if you get a high return rate, and that's five to 10 or 15, you're going to get pulled off. And so to make sure that you're selling the right product first, that you have your warranty stuff under control, to make sure that you've got that. Because your first production batch is, is a bit of a crapshoot. It's like, oh, this zipper was on that bottom corner of the bag and it keeps breaking off for every other customer after three months of use. Like, you need to know these things. <laughs> um, so you, uh, were you doing were you fulfillment with Amazon or are you fulfilling yourself? Or how would you handle film inside? We've done both. Fulfillment by Amazon has been the preferred route for us internally. This year we actually brought on a partner to handle our Amazon sales. They buy inventory from us, FOB China. We ship it to them, they handle sales, fulfillment, marketing of it. How do you figure out your fulfillment side? Because I mean, everyone, like we were talking earlier about the production side, but there's a lot of steps people forget like that actually comes to launching a product. Like you have your idea, you have to create the concept, you raise the money on Kickstarter, you uh, you went to China, you found the production, now you actually have the product and you have to ship it out. Yeah. How do you how do you figure out the actual fulfillment side of it? So it depends on the size and scale of your business. For us, we our first batch we were shipping out nine thousand units to people in sixty different countries, so we needed to have a pretty robust system in place. If you're doing five hundred units or up to that, you're probably better off doing it in your mom's garage. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of fulfillment centers called three PLs, third party logistics companies. They're based a lot of them are in California. That's one of the better points of entry. So we work with one based in Los Angeles. Um, Easy Post is a good one. They've got really cheap shipping rates. Um, and we ship all the products into them. They stick for them, ship them out, and then it's pretty automated. You can connect it to your Shopify or to your Amazon and ship out from there. Very cool. Um, initially, we had five fulfillment centers because you know my, my dreams were, OK, well, we did 600 again, Kickstarter, 600 again, and you go to 1.2 million in our first like, six or eight months. It's like, hey, next year, we're going to do $75 million. So let's get 
fulfillment centers all around the world. We have five three PLs: one in Hong Kong, one in Canada, one in California, one in Holland, and one in Australia. And the like bouncing inventory across all these like it was terrible. <laughs> So you're down to one now. We're down to one now. And All right. Simplifies a lot. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, the shipping is a, is a tends to be a nightmare because like everyone because of Amazon expects free shipping on everything. Obviously, it's like if suitcases and luggage like large items, yeah. uh, shipping costs get expensive. So most of them, people kind of forget to take into account when they're uh, building out their products and building out their web, their website. Um, so yes, free shipping is great, but keep that in mind that shipping costs are not cheap. And free shipping and free return sounds really nice. Yeah, and then <laughs> until you start paying for it. <laughs> yeah, so um, can you elaborate on like what it's uh, actually the cost that go into returns? Because when people say free shipping, free returns, that's great. It's like worry free, but they don't take into account the actual burden on the, so, the seller. Yeah, so for us, it's between 15 and 20 bucks to ship a suitcase to someone in the continent in the US. Then the return is going to be 25 or 30. So if someone buys a product and returns it, that costs us 50 bucks plus whatever it costs to acquire that customer. So it's like, wow, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's something that, one, again, it's something everyone always wants to order and uh, offer and should offer, but just make sure you take that into account with your economics when you're running your business. Um, so we have five minutes left, and uh, I just want to open the floor if anyone has any questions for Adrian about uh, launch your brand, with ideas. Um, I just want to know the name of the backpack. Oh, Solgard, S-O-L-G-A-A-R-E. It's the Norwegian word for Sun Farm. I think you're next. So. Yes. Okay. Um, so, what were some of the ways that you marketed your product before you ran it on Amazon? Uh, Facebook and Instagram. Facebook and Instagram. The majority of our okay. works. And PR. So we get we get PR as like our entrance into the funnel. Yeah. Then people go to our website and then you retarget them through that. Okay. So got it. I know the platform that works too for native advertising. We can use the Forest Upbrain. That works somewhat, but it's not not been as effective for us as Facebook. Okay. Does, so. So Instagram and Facebook were like the most successful for you. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Actually, our roommate on Snapchat's the same thing now. <laughs> Snapchat. We're targeting Snapchat's like eight or ten. Really? Snapchat's very underutilized right now. Um, it's still some cheaper CPMs and like advertising costs on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, but prospection's a little harder. But we're targeting. We've been killing it. Yeah. So how do you decide? Um, what's the thought process behind having multiple products instead of going like all in on one? Yeah. I mean, I've got ADD and I'm distractible, so there's one answer. The other one is, so backpack is a product that people buy on average guys buy once every three to four years. Women buy like three bags a year statistically. So we're looking at introducing some women's bags to sort of fit that in. But it's, part of it is having multiple products. So if someone comes into the brand and then giving them something else to buy from the brand to continue you know, being loyal to us over time, because there's certain products that aren't you know, reusable. If I was, shoes. I would love to get into shoes because, like, I'll buy five pairs of shoes a year, no problem, no questions asked. So many times, so easy. But yeah, tons of skews, tons of things. So, yeah, it's a, it's an ongoing debate about yeah. what the next two years of business looks like. Thanks, bro. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you talked a bit about the migration potential from Snapchat and Instagram to TikTok. And other spaces. Can you help talk a little bit more to your experience in terms of the targeting and also uh, affiliate mar affiliate and sort of like uh, uh, influence of marketing. Yeah, so, well, affiliate marketing is, is doing pretty well for us right now. It attributes to like the 10 or 50% of our sales on our site. Uh, and that's been a really good way because they go after their audiences. They kind of do their own thing. I'm not directly involved in how they do it. Our, our web guys <laughs> handle that. So, um, but yeah, that's been a part. And the influencer marketing, I think it's more about credibility than it is about what the direct sales are that come from it so far is what we found. But we're looking at doing like limited edition products with certain influencers. And then I think there'll be more of a direct sale app. And how did you feel the difference in audience was between TikTok and Instagram? We're, we're still really early days on TikTok stuff. None of the none of the partnerships have actually launched yet. They're all coming up. We've had preview videos this week. We're going to launch next week. So, yeah. The launching a product is there any is, is there still hope for organic reach and uh, word of mouth, or is it the best way to do it is through advertising? Uh, there absolutely is. It depends on how many units you're looking at selling. Word of mouth will help you get your first hundred units out the door, mm -hmm. uh, but your first ten thousand you're certainly How much uh, social media do you use now? Um, what do you mean, for ads or for posting? Yeah, for organic yeah, or? yeah, posting and so forth. We, we've turned our posting way back. Instagram's algorithm has changed. Our, our reach has gone down so much that it's, it's just, in, in terms of being a small team, there's only so much effort and, and hours we have in the day. So we're focusing more of our effort on getting great ads that work and convert and pushing those rather than posting a ton of organic content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the organic side.
be a great showcase for your brand to show people using your product and encourage people to like later on after they click on your ads. But the reach on Instagram has gone down a lot and Facebook kind of wants you to pay always to get maximum exposure to your full audience. Great, thank you. I was just gonna ask, what was your return on investment like when you put like, oh, so much towards Facebook or Instagram, how much do you make back? Uh, so our return on investment for Facebook, it averages up to about three and a half. Okay. You mentioned creating a mold for your product. Um, first of all, did you go overseas to create that mold? And what, what steps did you take to um, <coughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, we went overseas to create the molds are all made over there. You can also get plastic molds with stuff done locally as well. The actual cost of the mold isn't too different in China versus here in production. It's just a simple plastic product. But since we have batteries, everything is done over there. So we worked with a 3D designer to make the files for the shape we want. It, make sure it like, felt right, and then we sent those files to go back to China. They then make the mold and go from there. We get samples sent back and forth. Yeah. What insights can you share about working or trying to find the right uh, manufacturer out of China? Like I know you mentioned, like source it from that specific list, but like any like points or questions that you do or something to make sure that like you're going to get good samples and you're not just going to waste your time. Uh, you are going to waste your time. It's like speed dating. It's like dating. How many Tinder dates do you need to go on before you meet someone you actually like? <laughs> right? Like a few. So you're gonna to need to go, you're gonna to need to go to the factories. So but you can vet them out as best you can before that. So you know, getting download the app WeChat, which is what their preferred texting app is like WhatsApp. And and working with a factory that's responsive, that sends you samples, the samples are good quality, then when you go to meet them, they'll host you. You'll have to spend at least four hours with them if they'll want to take you for lunch. Then if they really like you, they'll want to take you for drinks after and take you for karaoke and all that. So to, it, you need to allow out a bunch of time for it. Um, but finding the right factory, if it's if you're going to be using just one factory, it's really worth that investment. Because the more that you have a good relationship with your factory person, the more um, the, the the more they're willing to do for you, and you're going to need a lot of favors. So. <laughs> Anyway. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Adrian.